All right. I don't think I can embarrass John and Sue any more than Shane already has, so we'll just let that go. Appreciate the invite, though, afterwards, and look forward to seeing some folks over there. Uh, noticed uh, yesterday they did have roses on all of the uh, tables, very fitting. It's a very nice uh, uh, occasion that, that was spent yesterday evening. When Jeannie and I first got married, uh, we uh, lived in a trailer in Wadesville, and I, you know, I've, you've heard me talk about mowing the grass. I always try to find ways not to do that. It, it doesn't appeal to me. We got a goat, got a Nubian goat. I thought that was the ticket to having a nice manicured lawn, and we called the goat Punch because he would punch uh, everything that he ate before he ate it. Uh, I had a nice row of green beans. They disappeared. All, I remember all those things, but we had neighbor... Uh, Hugh and I, Rita Eaton, they, they both were Christians when they passed away, attended church with, with them, and uh, they, they were married 65 years, 65 years, and when they had their anniversary, uh, here come the florist out in Hooterville and delivered roses to them from President Ronald Reagan. It's a rare thing. That was really something, and uh, I got a call at 4.30 in the morning, the day after they delivered President Reagan's roses. Punch went over there and ate every one of them roses. <laughs> Looked like somebody poured a box of cocoa puffs all over the porch too. I was over there at 4 30 in the morning cleaning all that up and had coffee. It was okay. They got over fast. They were very patient with the young married couple with the Nubian goat. John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Let's, let's begin reading there. Let's be in the Word of God. Let's look at verse 13. He says, The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found the temple who's, uh, those, the temple of those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them out, all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business or merchandise. Let me ask you, when you think of Jesus, what do you think about Jesus? Do you think when you think about Jesus, I'll tell you what, that Jesus got a temper. You know that? When I think about Jesus, I'll tell you what, I think about Jesus, when I picture Jesus, he's hot under the collar. It doesn't take too much. I'll tell you what, Jesus is going to be turning up some tables here. Jesus is going to be pouring out some money all over the place, kicking chairs across the room, said nobody ever. That's not how we picture Jesus. That's not how we think about Jesus. We think about Jesus as being humble, meek, gentle. Jesus is kind, that baby in the manger picture that we get of Jesus. Jesus, in our minds, is what? Jesus is also very nice. In fact, it might bother somebody when you read a passage like this that shows that, that Jesus has become angry. And Jesus, in fact, here is angry. And the reality is, I think we have a hard time picturing Jesus' anger being the Son of God. I'm working on another lesson. I mentioned to Harvey this morning about, I think I'm finding in the Old Testament, the wrath of God. People have a problem with that. But I'm finding that there's a difference in an angry God and a God that gets angry. Maybe later on we'll have a lesson on that. But we commonly call that the wrath of God. And the wrath, that, that makes people uncomfortable when we talk about the anger of God. But, but this morning I want us to think a little bit about what many people would think about being unthinkable, and that is the anger of Jesus. And I want to think about that because there's some hard questions, and sometimes I think we have a problem wrestling with the anger of Jesus. And, and for example, this passage here. John chapter 2, you know, you're going to look at that. You, you, you can do a couple things with it. You can pretend that, that Jesus really wasn't angry there. You can pretend that that doesn't happen. You can ignore the passage, maybe privately think to yourself, well, I'm a little bit embarrassed that, that it looks like Jesus is acting like a two-year-old there. Maybe he needs to be corrected. And you've got to work that out, I think. And I think we've got to, to figure out what the Scriptures is projecting there. We've got to do something with that. And maybe I should say this, how confident are you that, that you might worship or be worshiping or, or what folks want you to worship or the picture that you have of worshiping a spineless God. Is Jesus king of the wimps? Are we a, a kingdom of a bunch of sissies? How is that? Is he Lord of lords and king of kings? Is he we give reverence and awe to? Is, is he just some kind of spineless, oh, now let's be nice? 
And you've got to wrestle with that aspect. And I look at that. There's a lot of work here. I think when we start talking about Jesus and his anger. So this morning I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the elephant that's sometimes in the room. Jesus never gets angry. And then I want to move past that. And I want us to learn. I want us to learn from Jesus' experiences with being angry. And his expressions of anger. Well, begin with, you say, did, did Jesus ever get angry? Well, the answer to that's obvious. Just for this passage alone, Jesus got angry. John chapter 2. Let's look at some other passages. Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. Let's look at some other passages. Jesus here is confronted with a man with a withered hand. Mark chapter 3, verse 5. There are some people that are absolutely angry because Jesus is healing here on the Sabbath. After looking around at them, with what? With anger. Anger grieved at their hardness of their heart. He said to him, stretch out your hand. So not only John chapter 2, here's Mark chapter 3. Turn to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. I want you to notice in John chapter 11, I, want, I think maybe this passage might reflect our resistance, maybe our resistance to discuss the anger of Jesus. John chapter 11, verse 33, Jesus comes to the tomb of Lazarus. All right, we, and his friend is dying, and, and there's a lot of pain there, a lot of emotion there. It's an emotional scene, family members, his friends. John chapter 11, verse 33, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. Well, in some occurrences, that, that, that deeply moved in spirit, you know how that's actually translated? That's anger. That's anger. Again, it's used in verse 38. Look on down. Deeply moved again there when he came to the tomb. Maybe the fact that it's not translated anger. Why was Jesus angry? Why was Jesus deeply moved? He was angry and deeply moved from the scene that he was seeing, from what sin has caused in this world. Sin has caused death and separation. He's angry about that. And so it's not translated that way. Maybe. Maybe we're just not too sure about that. I think there are lots of places that, that if we start to understand something about the anger of Jesus... Maybe sometimes when we read these passages, maybe we'll see it in a, I want to say, a different lie. Let's go into Matthew's gospel. We're going to work out of it a little bit. This ought to be uh, very familiar with those in the adult class. Matthew chapter 8. I want you to notice verse uh, 23. Jesus gets in a boat. Uh, verse 24, there's a storm. We remember that. Uh, verse 25, there's panic. Uh, they, uh, they finally get Jesus up. Because we're all going to die. They're in panic. Uh, verse 26. Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? You of little faith. Now listen. There's anger in there. There's anger in that voice. I, I think there's anger there. Look at Matthew chapter 11. Notice again. Verse 20. Matthew 11 verse 20. Then he began to denounce the cities and most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted in heaven, will you? You, he says, will be descended to hell for the miracles that occurred in Sodom or if they'd occurred in Sodom which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. There's anger in those words. And you look at that, there's, it's there. How are you going to read those passages? Oh, no, that's not very nice. You don't read it like that. Verse 24, nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. There's anger in the Lord's words. There's emotion there. What? Jesus, Jesus is doing that. He's on that. Matthew chapter 12. Notice verse 34. Jesus is upset. He's upset. The Pharisees had, they had this determination to resist him. To, and they're not going to believe him despite all the miracles, despite all the evidence. Verse 34. You brood of vipers. Wow. Wow. Brood of vipers. How about verse, let's see, 38? What's he say? 
Matthew 12, verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign. We want to see a sign from him. Jesus said, An evil, adulterous generation craves for a sign. Yet no sign will be given except for the sign of Jonas the prophet. See, when you begin to actually read some passages and look at it, Jesus actually could be and get really angry. He could get angry. Suddenly that meek and mild Jesus that doesn't confront anybody, that doesn't, doesn't show that emotion, suddenly that kind of goes away. To the Jesus in the New Testament, that character of Jesus, that you get a biblical picture of Jesus, that, that here's, here's the Lord that confronted men. And he confronted women. He expected them to respond. We'll see that again. Matthew 16. Peter had just, in Matthew 16, just got a gold star here for recognizing uh, that, that and understanding some things of Jesus. Jesus said, listen, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. I'm going to be killed. All right. And, and I'm going to be raised. Matthew 16. Let's see. Let's look at verse 22. Peter said to him uh, and took him aside and said, begin to rebuke him, saying, now, now God forbid that. God forbid that, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, get behind me. Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. For you're not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's interest. You read that in a wimpy voice? You read that in a sissy voice? In a spineless voice? I'll tell you what, that, that's strong. That's strong and powerful teaching. I'll give you one more. Let's go to Revelation. Revelation chapter 3. Jesus addresses the church that had everything. Laodicea, verse 16. So because you are lukewarm, you're not hot or cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You ever heard anybody say, I'm so mad I can spit nails? I can just spit nails. That's, that's, what, that's what this says. I defy anyone to look at the teaching of Jesus Christ and not find many places the Lord's eyes flashing and he emphatically saying, you need to listen to this. You need to respond to this. You need to listen to this. This is, this is part of the gospel. This is part of the kingdom. Now, in all the Bible, when you're talking about the Lord, you know, there's, a lot of, there's not a lot of places. That's one of my point. In when Jesus is associated with children, have you noticed the very few places, the one or two places that that happens, that children gravitate to the Lord? Jesus loved children. And, and you can tell that children loved him. He knew how to relate to them. He could do that. We get lots about that. We're all comfortable with that. And we think about that. We think about Jesus. But can we not in the same way look at a couple of places like we have where the anger is explicitly, we can see that and attribute that to Jesus, the cleansing of the temple, his dealing with the Pharisees, all through Scripture. Can we not at, at some of these teachings of Jesus some way recognize how much Jesus despised hypocrisy when he encountered that, when he saw that, when he saw greed, when he saw hard-heartedness. His reaction was what? What was his reaction? His reaction was to be upset. He didn't like it. Yes, Jesus can be kind. Yes, Jesus is humble. Yes, Jesus is all of those things, gentle and meek, and he brought people to the gospel by being that way. But I'll tell you what, if people refuse to get it, they got something else. They've seen another side of Jesus if they refuse that. You know, let's be honest. You know, I think if I got up here and said, hey, uh, you know what, let's read John chapter 2. Jesus got a little upset at the temple. Yeah, yeah, Jesus got angry. But you know, if, if we had to really be honest and admit it, you know, we really don't think about the anger of Jesus as being a core component of who Jesus Christ really is. We don't think about Jesus. But, but I look at the scriptures. I'm going to tell you something. People seen that in Jesus. And I'll tell you, they've seen it a lot. A lot. You know, let me illustrate that. You know, I think, I think weird stuff, but I think about Jesus coming to dinner. I'm going to invite Jesus over for supper. And isn't there a show or two where people can list some five, thing, five people, five famous people that they would like to have over dinner? Who's five people that you'd like to have over dinner? A lot of times, Jesus is mentioned in that. I don't know where I've seen that. But, but that always provokes some good conversation and thought. And, and I, as you read the scripture, I think Luke is the, the account where Jesus always eating dinner, always eating with somebody, anybody, everywhere. He's invited to a lot. He's a dinner guest a lot in the Gospel of Luke. But I've thought about it, and what would it be like to have Jesus come over for dinner? What, what would that be like? You ever really think about that? 
And remember, Jesus was, uh, was, lived under the Mosaic law. He was a Jew, so you can't have bacon. He liked my house, vegan time. Blend us out of the Lord. Uh, you know, I just think about stuff like that. But, but uh, you know, of course, you clean up. You clean the house up. You get everything all ready. But I must tell you something I never thought about. I never thought about maybe if the neighbor came. And before we got to dinner with Jesus, I never thought about getting with the neighbor and saying, hey, hey, hey. You know, when we sit down to dinner with Jesus, hey, you know how we always talk about one religion is good as another and it's okay to translate the Bible however you want to translate it? Hey, hey, don't say that. He'll blow up if you say that. I never thought about it. Never thought about uh, preferencing in that terms. Or you're sitting at dinner and, and somebody's surprised and, and they say, oh my God. There's nothing about the Lord's name in vain. That wouldn't be good, would it? Wouldn't want that to happen there. Can you imagine after supper somebody saying, Woohoo, I'm glad Jesus is gone now. I'll tell you what, when, when, that, when that guy said, you know, I, I'm, I'm into Jesus, but I really don't go to church, I thought he was going to blow up. I'm glad that cooled over. See how that is? We don't think of it like that. We have an incomplete picture of Jesus. You have Jesus over for dinner. And you invite your friends, and maybe one of your friends is spiritually apathetic and indifferent. And, and you know, you know, can you see Jesus looking at him and saying, "Hey, man, I'm glad you you go to church two or three times every six months. Hey, that's good. Everything's laid back. It's all good." You think how, how that's going to go? You think the Lord's going to say that? I think we've left a huge part of the character of Jesus out. Folks, the Lord had zeal for righteousness. He loved holiness. Jesus loved enthusiasm for the word of God. He had a sincere desire for men and women to live right, to honor God, to glorify God. It went deep in his emotions. We don't think about Jesus getting angry. But I'll tell you what, we should. And we ought to. That's a part of who Jesus was. Don't you get okay with that? I, th I think we get a better picture of him. I, get, I think we get a total picture of him. That, that Jesus pushed people to do right. Very emotional about that. What do we do with all that? You know, I want you to, I guess what's important this morning, maybe what I'm trying to drive at, is not only that we update our vision on Jesus, I think a lot of us need that, but we need to watch Jesus when he's angry. I think we need to listen to Jesus when he's angry. I think we need to see his actions when we're angry. And we know that Jesus did not sin. Mickey's reading in Hebrews 4, many other places. There was sinless anger. We always talk about his righteous anger. We always go to John chapter 2. We know that Paul says that we ought not, what, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. You can be angry and sin not. And so all the anger, all the things that we've been reading, Jesus never sinned. But yet he shows that emotion. So we're dealing with Jesus here. We're dealing with it's okay to be angry. It's okay to be angry. And we're watching him. We're listening to him. And I'll tell you what. In these things, we can get some insights as Christians, as disciples of Christ, how we can be angry. And that we can be angry and we cannot sin. That, in other words, we can be good. We can be good and angry. Because the Lord was good and angry. I want to share with you five quick points, and the lesson will be yours, about being angry, about what I think you can learn from Jesus in these passages. Point one, I think we need to begin with understanding that, that Jesus was angry about sin. I know that's a given, but I think we need to put that on the table. You know, Jesus never got angry because somebody took your parking space or, or took the last donut out of the break room. That's, that's not what Jesus got mad about. What did Jesus get mad about? Sin. Sin was the cause of Jesus' anger. He hates sin. And you think about it, when, when your soul was in danger, you read in the New Testament, when the souls of others were in danger, the ungodly conduct, the behavior, the teaching, the false teaching, that's what Jesus got angry about. That's what Jesus got, and I think that's demonstrated over and over again in the passages that we read. I could read 58 more verses, but I think you're going to get it. But also somewhere in there, I, th I think you need to be getting to ask yourself, thinking about that, well, what would be different in my life? What would be different in your life if the only thing you got angry about was sin? What would be different about your life 
If that's what you got mad about, if that's what you got angry about, for some of us, for some of us, I think that means we're going to have to up the, the angry quotient for some of us. You know what? Maybe I'm not sufficiently passionate enough. Maybe it doesn't bother me like it should. Sin. A lot of times when we see sin, what we do? Eh. <laughs> this sin. That's not Jesus. I told a, I shared a story with a few of you about going to North Carolina and we're selling our house, looking at selling our house, and some people that looked at our house, living in sin. And I told the story and shared the story, and I laughed about the story, and I, everybody laughed that I told. But you know why I did this lesson? I got to think about it. maybe I should have got angry about that. Should have got mad about that. Didn't make me mad enough. So I looked at my own self. And, and, and you know what? If we don't get angry at sin, I tell you, we're not like Jesus. If sin out there doesn't make you mad, you're not like the Lord. That's not what Jesus, for some of us, that means too that we're going to have to stop letting things that don't matter make us angry. Things that don't matter don't need to make you angry. It is not the end of the world if your coffee's not made just right. You need to think about that. Anger, Jesus' anger, I can tell you, is totally reserved for sin. Second point, we need to be careful when we get angry. A little bit of the prodigal son, Luke chapter 15. Look down at the end of that parable, Luke 15. Lots of times we talk about the prodigal, maybe failing to grapple with the real reason that Jesus has told these three lost and found stories but, but and, and that's the elder brother there. There's been lessons on him. He's refusing to participate and have joy in the repentance of his brother. The prodigals come home. And, and what's the issue? Well, why isn't he doing handstands? Why isn't he uh, excited about his, his brother finally coming home? Well, it's in verse uh, 28. He says, here, there it is. He was angry and refused to go in. He's mad. He's angry. Well, you know, that's not just about sin. That's about selfishness. That's about pride. That's about my rights. And someone's pointed out that when you have anger, you know what? Just one letter separates anger and danger. Anger and danger. And that's just not a quirk with the English spelling. But, but I think that's the thing Jesus would agree with. Back again in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus speaks about that. Matthew chapter 5. Let's go back. Let's look at verse 22. Matthew 5 and 22. A lot of Matthew today. He says this. He says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, New American Standard, you shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into fiery hell. The Jeff Dorton, West Virginia International uh, version there so it talks about the danger of being angry. But you know something? Really, it just says fix it. You need to fix that. That's what, what, what that passage says. If, if that's happening, you need to fix that. But you know, when you look at, that, at the word angry, you hear somebody say, I'm angry. A lot of times you hear somebody say, I'm mad. I'm mad. Mad is a synonym for crazy. Mad is a synonym for crazy. I'm out of my mind. I'm so mad. I'm out of my mind. I got mad. I got out of my mind. Now, what that represents is when you get angry, what happens to you physically? Well, muscles start to tense up. Your eyes start to squint. Your blood pressure goes up. All these physical things. And then on top of that, all this adrenaline's being pumped into you. And you get mad. You get crazy. You get out of your mind. And I think about that. Do you think Jesus knows what's that about? Do you think that when Jesus was in the temple, do you think Jesus felt all those physical things that you feel when you get angry, when you get mad. Jesus felt those physical reactions. That's why he's warning us. Remember, Jesus never sinned. He never sinned when he got angry, but he was tempted in all points as we are, as the Hebrew writer says, which means Jesus knew about the temptation of what? Flying off the handle. I'm so mad. I'm crazy. John chapter 2, for example. He's steaming when he goes in that temple. He is angry when he goes into that temple. But you don't see him torching the temple and you don't see him slinging out a bunch of profanities and clearing it out that way. He didn't do that. Jesus never let anger. Jesus never let anger be an excuse for sin. 
And he never let anger be an excuse for losing self-control. When Jesus was angry, everything that he said and did was intentional. And it was delivered, it was measured to make the point that Jesus wanted to make. Thus, he never crossed the line of sin. But that's not easy. Not easy to do that. Not easy for Jesus, and I'll tell you what, it's not easy for us. In the heat of the moment, it's hard to think clearly. It's hard to to do the right thing. It's hard to restrain our mouths. That's why Jesus is teaching this. That's why Jesus is saying this. Be careful. You need to be careful. Because when you're angry, very, very dangerous. Matthew chapter 5 again. Let's go back there. I'll show you why that is. Jesus says it's better not to let anger fester. Verse 23. Therefore, he says, the conclusion, he says, if you are presenting your offering to the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there at the altar, go to be reconciled with your brother, then come present your offering. Uh, that, that's the Jeff Dorton's international version there. I got ahead of myself. Need to fix that. Need to take care of that. This whole thing that uh, I'm, I'm mad, got mad at you 17 years ago, fix that. All right? Don't let that fester. Don't carry that around. Don't let that keep boiling inside of you. That's not in line with any of the Lord's teachings. As as Christians, we recognize that. And having said that, I think it's important to notice Jesus says that you ought to deal with anger. But you know what? I think there's a lesson that a lot of times you don't have to deal with anger right on the spot. Right right then. And anybody else notice that? Matthew chapter 12. I want you to notice Jesus again angry about the Pharisees, uh, the man with the withered hand. Matthew chapter 12. Let's look at verse 14. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. But Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Wow. Hey, I'm not going to have it out with you right now. You're, you're not ready for this. We're not going to talk about this now. I'm going to go away from you for a while. That, that's what he's doing. Jesus didn't chase after them. Say, wait a minute, let's fix this. Look at Matthew 16. Pharisees came to him, tested him. They wanted a sign. Matthew 16 Verse 2, but he said to them, whether it's evening you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. In the morning there will be storm today for the sky is red and threatening. Do you not know how to discern the appearance of the sky? You cannot discern the signs of the times. Evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. That's said in a sissy voice. And a sign will not be given to them except the sign of Jonah. And he left and he went away. You don't, can't hear that now. I don't need to deal with this now. You're not listening because you're angry. And I'm not going to discuss it with you. And so people are angry at Jesus, John chapter 10. John chapter 10, they're so mad at Jesus. Verse 31, they're going to pick up stones. They're going to kill him. Verse 39 says, he eluded their grasp. Absolutely, Jesus tells you, teaches you, shows us many times we need to deal with our anger. But a lot of times, maybe not right then on the spot. And I think about the Lord. A lot of times, I'm going to Jerusalem. The disciples, don't go, don't go. The Jews are waiting there to kill you. He does everything that he can to help the Pharisees get to the place where they can understand his teaching to be right with God. But but notice, a lot of times, that doesn't mean right now. Well, I'm going to fix that right now. We have to have a better, uh, I think, an understanding of that because everything that we do is right now. I tell you what, I've seen that thing on Facebook. I'll tell you what, I'm going to get in that comment section. You ought to hear this. And we do those, what are those things called? The happy, funny looking thing, emoji. We do the mad face and the red face and I'm mad. Boy, right now we respond. Oh, I'm mad. I'm, I want you to hear what I got to say. And a lot of times we're in that position. Maybe we don't act too much like Jesus. And you know, a lot of times maybe when that anger is there, you know what, leave that alone for a while. That's, that's not always the best plan. It's not always the best plan to fix something when people are throwing up rocks to kill you. We need to recognize that and get that. That's not maybe the, best, the immediacy in the moment, all right? Maybe sometimes leads us up to things that we say and do that we wish we hadn't. And that's especially true when we have religious discussions. You know, one of the great things about Jesus is Jesus shows that you can press the truth without compromising the truth, without compromising the meaning of truth. I can show you that in the Bible, Matthew 22. Let's look at Matthew 22. 
Last week of Jesus' life, some folks came. They wanted to play question and answer with Jesus. These questions aren't sincere. They're testing Jesus. Matthew 22, Sadducees came up to him with a long question about the resurrection. They had this big hypothetical situation all ginned up. Jesus answers them, uh, Matthew 22, 29. Really what he answers them, he says, you're wrong. You're wrong about all of this. Look what he says in verse 29. He says, but Jesus answered and said, you're mistaken. You're not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God for in the resurrection either they marry or given to marriage but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, you have not read what is spoken to you by God. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, he says, but the living. Please notice that there is no compromise in truth here when Jesus is talking about When he's angry there. Anytime we get in discussion with the Bible, there are always a couple temptations when you discuss the Bible. One is that you're discussing the Bible with somebody. You know what you want to do? Water down the truth. Oh, yeah, you know, everything's the same. I'm glad you believe that. You want to water down the truth. You don't, you don't face the truth. You don't, you know, explain the truth. But Jesus never does that. And in this and many other occasions, Jesus says, you're just wrong. What's the other temptation? Well, the other temptation is, is a lot of times expressed in exasperated anger when you're talking to somebody. You know what? You are dumber than a box of rocks. I don't get why you don't understand that. And you get so mad because somebody don't get it. And they don't understand. That's the other extreme. You either sell out the truth or you just react in a way that, yeah, I'm going to respond to that. Yeah, tell me more how stupid I am. Many years ago, I knew somebody that wasn't a Christian. And he was deeply stooped in religious error. Good person. Moved away. And after hearing after the person had moved away, uh, he worked with somebody that was a member of the Lord's church. And I ran on to him, and you know what? He started talking. He's Christian. Obeyed the gospel, him and his family. Big, big influence in the area that he moved in. Asked him how it happened. Well, he, he, he was working with a fellow, and, and the fellow so patiently and, and calmly and kindly sat down and, and explained to him over and over many times what it meant, what it took to be a New Testament Christian. And he said, one day, he said, I looked up and all I was doing was getting angry. All I was doing, my reaction was I was getting mad. And over and over again, I was, I, was, I was just reacting that way. And it finally hit me, if I can't be calm and normal and react with, with what I believe the New Testament says, then maybe I just need to change, repent, be immersed in water for the forgiveness of my sins, and, and, and become a New Testament Christian. Telling me that story, I thought, you know what? I'm so glad that my brother in Christ was patient, was kind, never sold out the truth, and he took an earful from this fellow. He said, I gave it to him. He said, I gave it to him in heated anger many, many times. He never reacted that way. He just reacted with what the Bible plainly says. It was apparent to him this man's love for the truth, love for God, what Jesus said. I thought, what a story. What a story that is. And that resulted in the conversion of that man. How about that? You know, when I think about Jesus, he never gets ugly. He never gets mean. That's not the picture I want you to picture Jesus. Even in Matthew 23, when, when he calls, he uses the word hypocrite more than six times when he's talking to the Pharisees. It's not vague name calling. Jesus is very specific about it. He's very careful about it. And he provides concrete examples of exactly what the point is that he wants to make. And that doesn't include being mean. That doesn't include being hateful. Even if it is a forceful tone, which he had, even if it is raising his voice, which it did, even if he has that look in his eyes, which he did, which we do, this matters. I need you to pay attention to this. This is very important. That's my Lord and Savior. Nothing spineless about him. He is Lord of Lords. He is King of Kings. Jesus is never ugly. That is the challenge for us. That's the challenge for us. Because when we use that anger, when we use that emotion, you know what it does? It presents us with the opportunity to present ourselves as Christians and to present, our, present the gospel as Jesus did. Please get your songbooks out. 
You know, it is of interest to me, as I read the New Testament, you know, Jesus' enemies, they said a lot of things about him. And you can read a lot of the disdaining, hateful, mean things that was said about our Lord and Savior. But you know one thing you can't find in the New Testament that anybody ever said about Jesus? That he had a temper. You can't find that. Jesus had enemies. But you know, Jesus knew how to get good and angry. I thank all of us. Do us all good to recognize how you and I can be good and angry. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's the gospel message. That's made a lot of people mad. Lots of people fall short and say, all you got to do is believe, you're saved. That's not what Mark 16, 16 says. Does that make you mad? Does that make you mad that Jesus said that you must believe and be baptized for the remission of sins? You mad about that? What's your reaction to that? You just want to believe this morning and think everything is okay? If Jesus was here, he'd say the same thing he said in this passage. You must do that to become a Christian. Please come as together we stand and sing.